Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Whenever in the world you are, we are just letting uh, people in, um, and I can see the numbers are rising. So um, we're just asking. Well, we will be waiting for maybe five minutes for everybody to join in. So uh, while we are waiting, um, I'll just do some housekeeping update um, on this event. I will. Thank you very much, first of all, for joining us today and our panel discussion. Um, we will be recording this event, uh, so um, we will post it on Candle YouTube channel. So if you want to revisit or share with someone else, please do that. Um, it's a uh, candle uh, on YouTube um, and we will be sending link afterwards. Today we have our panel discussion. Uh, we have four speakers. Um, two speakers are based in the UE and two speakers are based in the UK. Um, so we, but all of them, they have international and also Middle Eastern experience. So we will be um, keeping that kind of broad and global perspective on the conversation. Um, Richard Stratton will be moderating this panel. Um, so, but we want everybody to participate. So if you have any questions and you want to ask um, anyone in particular, please uh, use the chat box, Q&A box. We will be monitoring and we will try to um, uh, uh, ask the questions if we can throughout the conversation and if not at the end we will have 15 to 20 minutes dedicated to Q&A and uh, we will be uh, making sure that we'll cover most of the questions uh, today. The first one who I would like to introduce um, is Diane Thorsen, architect and interior designer and Diane is hospitality design director at Gansler. Diane has been in the design industry for over 30 years and her work covers um, international workplace, hospitality, healthcare, and mixed use developments. Her award-winning work focused on human-centric design with um, focus on design, creativity, and collaboration, and forward-thinking uh, perspective. So, Diane, we are very much looking forward to hearing more about that today, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, and good to join um, this discussion. Yes, thanks, Diane. Um, the second um, and UE-based speaker is Tom Sweeney. Tom is MEP director at uh, Majid Alpha Tame, uh, one of the largest retailer in the MENA region. Tom has over 15 years of experience in building services in the UK and in the UAE. And in his current role as MEP director, um, Tom not only... Um, responsible for the MEP designs on current projects, but also uh, developing technical design standards that will support the business to achieve the aspirational goal uh, to become net zero by 2030 and net positive by 2040. That's very interesting, Tom. Welcome and thank you very much for joining. Olga, thanks for the invite and thanks for the introduction. Um, now, moving on to our UK-based speakers, um, so Tony Burley. Um, Tony is Architect and Regional Director for UK and Ireland at IBI Group. Tony has over 25 years of experience in international healthcare, research and mixed-use developments. And the multiple perspective from his broad experience provides Tony with a real understanding of challenges and opportunities of integrating health users into the cities. That's a very interesting perspective and we look forward to hearing more about that, Tony, today. Thank you for joining. Thank you, um, Olga. Delighted to be part of the discussion. That's great. Um, and uh, our fourth speaker, Alan Fogarty. Alan is partner and head of sustainability of uh, UK and MENA at Candle. Um, Alan has been with Candle for 21 years. And prior to that, uh, he worked for a number of years in Australia, where he gained in-depth experience in passive building design um, for the Sydney Olympics. Alan is very passionate about sustainability and he will be sharing his perspective today on climate change and adaptation of the design in the future. Thank you for joining, Alan. Good morning and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. 
Okay, great. Uh, and the moderator of today's panel discussion is uh, Richard Stratton. Richard is a partner at Candle and uh, sits on the board and he leads our Middle East office. Um, Richard has over 30 years of experience in the Middle East. Um, sorry, in construction industry all over the world <laughs> and uh, spanning across most of the sectors. Um, Richard strongly believes that as leaders, we have a duty to inspire and develop our future leaders and industry as a whole to be agent of change. And on that note, I would like to pass it to Richard. Richard, over to you. Thanks, Olga, um, and Ramadan Kareem, and hello to everybody, and thank you all for taking the time to join our event. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists for supporting this event and engaging in this discussion around what I think is going to be a very thought-provoking uh, topic. And uh, I've had pleasure the pleasure of working with uh, all the panellists uh, quite a lot over the years, so I'm looking forward to some lively discussions. Um, I think when it comes to COVID-19 and this whole coronavirus issue, it's changed the way we behave, the way we work, our environment, and, and as a consequence, uh, it's going to have to change how we consider design for the future. Um, the crisis uh, has created an opportunity, I think, for us all to reflect on how we behave personally and, and how we behave as an industry. And it's shown how adaptable and resilient we can all be. Um, and this can have long-term benefits uh, for the future if we embrace the positives and uh, learn from the negatives. So I'm hoping we can all debate this, discuss it, and working together, I think we can all contribute to a really positive change. So without really waffling on too much more, um, I'll sort of jump straight into the questions. Uh, and I'd like to direct this first one at, uh, towards Alan Fogarty. Um, the 2020, uh, just you know, from my own kind of reading of what's been going on, the 2020 global emissions are expected to fall in the order of sort of five percent. Uh, they say because of the impact of uh, the the lockdown associated with the coronavirus pandemic, and that compares to about 1.4 percent back in the 2008-2009 crisis. Um, I suppose it's a couple of points, really. Do you think that's likely to be maintainable when everything refer, returns to the, I guess, what we'll all end up calling the new normal? Um, uh, you know, and, and, and what can people and government do to try and uh, drive that change and, and drive towards maintaining much higher uh, carbon reduction? Okay, it's a, it's a complicated question to answer. Certainly before the virus struck, the world emissions were increasing on an annual basis, uh, largely down to um, increased growth in China. And that was due to continue till about 2030 before they were suggesting that it would level off. Um, I think what happens in the next couple of years will be a reflection of what level of damage has been done to the economies. Um, so we could see lower levels of carbon emissions associated with that, but that's not necessarily a good picture to paint because it's not reflecting normal activity within the economies themselves and people will be struggling as a result of that. Um, so do I think that uh, we're going to keep seeing lowering levels of CO2 emissions? I would say that we will probably stay stable at the kind of levels we're at now and then start seeing it to increase again. There are a number of things that are starting to kind of uh, play. And the question is, which, um, uh, which, which drives it? Certainly in the UK, we're seeing huge interest in zero carbon, um, both as businesses and in terms of how bu buildings are uh, being considered. So to my mind, the question is whether that interest continues to grow. Um, if it does, then you'll see transformation of the market here. And that then can potentially be exported to other parts of the world. And people can learn lessons as to how they can design uh, buildings in a way that are far more environmentally benign. So it really depends how that interplay works out. Um, what can people do? What can governments do? Well, we can see that we can function from home. That means then the need for more office space is reduced. The need for people to commute everywhere is reduced. The need for people to fly is reduced as well. 
So there is a lot we can do both from kind of potentially energy use plus a social um, interaction that can that can change and modify, and then that could have then then substantial um, uh, impacts on CO two emissions. So I I don't have a simple answer. It'll it'll really depend on how the the whole thing interplays. Um, there's, there's never a simple answer, is there? Alan? I mean, what, one thing I was thinking was. In, ter- in terms of global warming and planet recovery terms, um, I don't know, you know, we've got lots of people on the call. Um, what sort of percentage reduction in carbon emissions would we need to achieve in order to do no further damage to the planet? Is it more than 5%? Oh, well, it, it's not as simple as that because there's an absolute limit. And if we're not seeing reductions in the uh, the current levels of uh, emissions, then certainly the the two degree um, max temperature rise could be hit by twenty thirty five. So the the absolute numbers need to come down as quickly as possible. And there's a whole range of uncertainty around these numbers anyway, because it's such a complicated um, system that we're looking at. The modelling is by no means. 100% accurate. So all you can do is try and get things down as low as possible, as quickly as possible, and kind of hope for the best at that point. It's 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 mm-hmm. not an exact science. So you touched yeah, on I just want to uh, yeah, sorry, Karen, sorry uh, contribute something to that because I think as obviously as architects and designers, you know, we have a, a major impact, positive in, impact to make. So what's really interesting is our 2017 uh, Gensler data. Um, and calculations showed that, um, you know, the project that we were working on specifically through design interventions actually um, saved approximately 11 million metric tons of carbon dioxide every year, which is phenomenal. Um, And we know, you know, that buildings contribute around 40% of the global greenhouse gas emissions and, you know, it's 50% of of, um, the energy. So I think, you know, this... Uh, crisis has really created a wake-up call for all of us to really work together um, just in the positive um, impacts that we've seen um, and actually change the way that we focus on on design totally. Yeah. There's a few points that you've both of you have raised there that I'll come back to in a minute. But another question I, I was thinking about was uh, around how different countries have responded to the challenges um, that that have been presented by the pandemic and um, around self-sufficiency. You know, different countries have different uh, import-export arrangements, manufacturing arrangements and so on, and there's been um, suggestions of shortages of goods in certain places. I mean, I was sort of going to direct this at Tom being from uh, Majid Al-Fatain, but... um, you know, it's. It, what do you think about self-sufficiency and reliance on essential goods and what we could produce uh, more locally? Uh, how consumer behaviour could change, uh, and what impact we think that might have? Yeah, it's a good question, uh, Richard. Obviously, we're predominantly based in the Middle East, and most of the things that we purchase and for consumption here are imported. So we have obviously seen a massive impact on that, and I think the whole process of this situation is causing people to reassess what they think is essential and what they think they actually need to buy, which hopefully people will carry on post-COVID and cut down their overall consumption levels. But what we've seen working closely with our tenants is that the logistic uh, systems are actually working from an export-import perspective to kind of keep kept up good momentum. The problem we're seeing is that a lot of tenants are having a huge stockpile of stock, which they can't get rid of because the malls are obviously closed. What that's driving us to do, particularly through our car car for business, is look at how we can actually engage with the customers, give them what they need, and ultimately fix the only issue that we've got in the logistics stream, which is this last mile delivery. The main holistic international import exports are working, but the whole issue, and I think it's been an issue from what I've seen in the press in the UK, is the picking of goods and actually getting them delivered out to the people that need them. And I think a lot of focus going forward is going to be on this. And I think even though people will reassess what's essential, if people do continue to use internet shopping for groceries, standard uh, stock, et cetera, 
we need to make sure that this last mile delivery is as efficient as possible because otherwise we're going to be offsetting a family going to the mall or to the shops to buy something with 20 deliveries that are coming to a house. So I think that's something we need to focus on. From then making sure we're more self-sufficient and actually generating things locally, one thing we've been working with is local farmers and hydroponic farms. So in the, for the people that are in the UAE, you'll see now Carrefour this year will open nine hydroponic farms within the Carrefour stores. So that's been an interesting development to try to get particularly short life, mm -hmm. uh, shelf life items such as salads and herbs grown so local that it's in the store. So that's good. But yeah. what we envisage going forward, or personally and as, uh, from a business perspective, is people still need that experience with certain elements that they're going to buy. So a lot of this digital world or the digital element of experiencing products will continue and people will just buy these stock items more online. So I think the transition and the focus we're going to have to do as a mall operator is to ensure that our mall infrastructure is dynamically designed and flexible enough to accommodate a change in retail space where people are looking more for experience than actually buying things. That's interesting. And so the, the local production, agricultural production, hydroponics, those those sorts of initiatives that uh, you guys are considering, it, will that service the, all of the volume or is it no, going to no, be... So it, it's picking up certain shelf items, which we can actually accommodate fully from that. But we're oh. doing a lot of work with a lot of the farms that are in the region, the UAE, and their output's actually growing significantly with the increased rainfall, which is another interesting thing we've got in the last couple of years here due to the cloud seeding. So hopefully this, this local agricultural output is going to increase over the next few years. And we're focusing on trying to make sure that's used onshore to reduce this import of fresh vegetables. That's interesting. I just wanted to say something, you know, to the people, the, the audience that are there. If you've got any questions, there's a Q&A box at the bottom. Feel free to ask them. And as we go, if you want to ask them and we can pick them up and direct them to the panellists. Um, so just, you, pick, yeah, sorry, just to add to that point, like one thing we've seen over here, which is quite interesting, is that um, with restaurants closed, the... Um, stocks of fish have just kind of accumulated and they, the fishermen weren't able to get rid of them. So what they've started doing is selling the fish directly to people locally. So they've started setting up supply chains to, to directly supply fish. And they, they hadn't been able to, well, they hadn't considered doing that before. So they are now cutting out some of the supermarkets and the middlemen that are involved in the, the um, uh, fish supplies. So the, the way that industry is going to function in the future could change significantly. So we could be moving a little bit back towards the high street uh, retail experience. Possibly the butcher and the fishmonger and the grocer. Sorry, Tom. No, no, get the milkman <laughs> back in business. No, no. Look, I've seen a lot of articles in the press in the UK about milkmen delivering more than just milk and keeping obviously our local and rural communities alive. And I think that's got to come back into play, that local... Uh, localization of procurement is nothing but a good thing. See, I, the, the thing I like about that is a lot of what I like about how, and certainly in the community I'm involved in, uh, both professionally and personally, the bit I like is this whole sense of community. You know, the coronavirus has forced us uh, to to all have a lot of things in common that we probably haven't had before. And people are talking more, communicating more, caring more. And I guess that kind of high street, almost returning back to that, is is a bit like that whole community engagement piece. So that's quite nice, I guess. Yeah, it is. Um, it's actually, I think it's really uh, super exciting across all boards and so interesting to hear, Tom, what's happening locally. Because I think with hospitality in particular, you know, you're seeing that more and more, that engagement with community and the hospitality industry has been really hard hit by this. Uh, but the innovations that are coming through and the concepts that we're working on behind the scenes of things like, you know, engaging with community, farm to table, um, working on all of those aspects, local craftsmanship, um, all of this has a huge impact on, you know, our cities, engaging communities. Um, I see it as a lot of innovation and really positive across the board. Yeah. So picking up on something I think you touched on, Alan, and I wanted to kind of direct this uh, towards you, Di, which was um, as you know, st albeit some of the lockdowns are being relaxed, but social distancing has been mandated in most parts of the world, and so essentially, 
uh, pretty much everywhere in our business, um, our, our people are working from home. Um, and that's a massive departure from the traditional office-based environment. And, you know, I know there's been developments over the, over the years around co-working and, and various initiatives around creating more agile and flexible environments. But what, what do you see, Di, is the future of the office um, and the working environment? Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, topic and, and something that we've actually been debating ourselves. And, and the honest answer is, I think nobody knows. Uh, but I think that, you know, our um, surveys and research have really been so insightful for us, uh, because what Gensler did immediately, and we obviously um, span globally, um, but we did a survey uh, as a work from home survey within our region, which covered obviously the APME region. Um, so it includes China. So they were first hard hit the most, and then they actually have already returned back to work. Um, and I think what we're starting to see is that there are some key things that people really miss about um, the office. Um, they obviously miss the socializing aspect, um, the ergonomics, the community um, aspect. And so because of that, I think the office will always be the first choice of where people would want to be you know so our research has shown that even when given a choice of working in a coffee shop or that flexible working they would still primarily prefer to be in the office environment however this crisis has forced us to really adapt and become super flexible and I think there are a lot of things that we've learned from this experience that we're going to take going forward which I see as being very positive because there's a psychological aspect around the fear factor of going back into the office environment too quickly. So the social distancing and ensuring that we limit interactions, that we don't share technology, that we don't pick up pencils as you know we would do typically in an architectural environment, share that kind of closeness and um, lean over drawings, for example, have uh, interactions with people, you know, as consultants when, we, when we're interacting. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, the use of technology. So we see things like um, faceless recognition, uh, face recognition, um, touchless surfaces, uh, the application of materials, which I'm really interested for us to discuss on this, around what healthcare type of uh, equipment and um, surfaces um, and antimicrobial surfaces we can bring into the workplace. So, you know, this is such a vast topic, but I really see the workplace of the future being a blending of the things that we've learned work really well, coming into play more and more. And those um, that we learned, we actually really miss as being the things that we focus on. And then what I'm really excited about seeing is actually how we as designers can actually really focus on the health of buildings. Um, you know, so all the aspects that Richard, you and I have spoken about so often, you know, the aspects that, of well-building, bringing those in to the workplace, I think those are, are going to drive um, unbelievable and really innovative changes going forward. That's yeah, interesting. Can I add to that? Because I think this is a really important area in terms of what how buildings are going to look. Like, um, get, getting as an engineer, the things that we can control in terms of relative humidity and temperatures and so on. Well, low relative humidity is is bad for people in terms of how they feel that they have dry throats, etc. But equally, it it actually makes it easier for them to get infected by the viruses. So, making sure that all the systems are working properly in buildings. It's not just about productivity, it's about actually reducing infection, and people want to see that. And having more air in a building is a way of diluting the virus load, which again is quite appealing. But the point being, we've got to be very careful because if we're looking to get zero carbon buildings, all these other things are potentially throwing energy at it. So it's about saying, how can you design the building so that when there is risk of a pandemic, that it responds? but that's not the normal mode of operation. 
And it's interesting too, because in terms of looking at zero carbon buildings, one of the um, ways of reducing energy consumption is looking at natural ventilation in the spaces. And natural ventilation is actually a great way of getting lots of air into a space, which then dilutes the the, the viral load. Um, it's also a very low energy way of doing it as well. So trying to make sure that we, we, we look at uh, low energy ways of dealing with pandemics as opposed to just chucking energy at it all the time. And it's just getting that balance. And other things is like touch, et cetera. You can have really simple ways of getting moving around spaces, opening doors, et cetera. Like I've seen over in Spain there, they are uh, the 3D printing these little hooks, which they can use to grab hold of door handles and, and put it open. So it, people can be quite ingenious in the way they can kind of um, re respond to the issues themselves. So it's looking how we do all these things, how we move through spaces, how we limit contact with um, um, a potential sources of inf infection. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, our air quality has got a lot to play um, in that. So, you know, the filtration systems, particularly for us in, in the Middle East, where we're dealing with, you know, so much dust in the air, I think, is, you know, is, is going to be really challenging for, uh, particularly for MEP, uh, you know, it's something that we really need to look at, you know, how we can actually balance that. I have a few questions com coming in. Um, sorry, are you going to say something, Tom? Oh, I was going to say something very quickly, just on that point, Richard. And I think, obviously, uh, Diane then was touching about the air system, the filtration. I think what we all need to take cognizance of in this is the lessons we've learned from having to shut down and modify so quickly. So, for example, take a mall. It wasn't just a matter of, oh, we had to turn it off because you've still got car fours trading, you've still got pharmacies trading. So we've had to do a deep dive into how we actually switch these assets off and turn on and keep the air filtration working. And as Diane said, it correct. Uh, energy efficient, safe manner. So all these little lessons of what we need to then design into the next generation of product, I think we all need to take cognizance of. It's yeah. almost a good concept. So there's a couple of questions come through. I said some of them we'll probably deal with. I think they'll be addressed hopefully by some of the other things that we, we touch on. But one from Khalid, um, it's Khalid and Oman, who I know, uh, and he's asking, is there any... A survey that provides information about the production efficiency between working in an office and working remotely. I guess, Di, I don't know if you've got any statistics yeah. around that. So our survey actually covered that um, across all of our offices. And we were so uh, surprised, actually, to learn that productivity and efficiency wasn't um, affected at all. Um, and I think that's really due to technology. Um, and actually the attitude of, of individuals, because I'm sure we've all experienced a number of different things, we really had to make um, a determined effort to actually connect every single morning uh, to, uh, you know, with the team members and communication became absolutely vital. So there was a lot of um, almost over communicating. I think for all of us, we've experienced now spending our lives on uh, calls and, and constant meetings and workshopping. But uh, the feedback from both our clients and from our um, teams across the whole region, uh, productivity and efficiency was shown as being, um, in some cases, more effective. Um, and the reason being that there was um, no commuting to meetings. Um, the virtual meetings became far more efficient because they were often back-to-back, -back, so they were quite limited on time and uh, what technolo uh, technology allowed us to do was actually hold more virtual workshops with clients that enabled them to give us real live feedback and so we were able to actually make decisions on projects specifically very much quicker um, and the feedback from clients was very similar you know they found that once they had resolved the technology aspect they were actually able to, to work really efficiently. So, you know, that was, was really great. Um, the other point was just, you know, going having our China office go back to the office, they actually finding that it was almost like um, someone had pushed the pause button when they went into a work from home related to projects. And now the pause bu button has been lifted and all the projects are coming back. So it, it was 
um, back that I thought was, you know, really interesting. So it potentially won't do as much damage as perhaps is forecast. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I think we've probably, I'm not sure, like personally, I haven't seen too much or any real statistical data yet. I guess it's early days for lots of businesses. I guess our business has seen, you know, we expected a drop in productivity, but I, but generally I think we've not really seen any drop in productivity because people have responded in different ways. Uh, there is another uh, anonymous attendee has uh, made a statement, which I guess is, is worth considering for definite. Um, and it's saying some are arguing that we are looking at changing our design principles to accommodate COVID-19 requirements, mainly social distancing. Meanwhile, we're also looking at developing a vaccine within the next 12 to 18 months. So the question is, are we not being on the extreme of the proactive side in changing our design principles to accommodate circumstances that simply may not exist in 12 to 18 months, which I guess is a fair comment. Well, I, I, I agree with the, what's been said. It, it's, it's about looking at what you can do that would accommodate a kind of a, a strategy. So I mentioned things about look, looking at relative humidity, looking at air volumes, etc., and th that can have a positive impact on a person's productivity in a space anyway, and that's a good thing to do. It's making sure that, that for example, you, you could run ventilation systems all night to, again, dilute the, the viral load within the space itself, but you wouldn't want to do that on a continuous basis because the impact then on energy consumption will be enormous. So it's to mm -hmm. un understand what, what kind of actions can be accommodated in, in existing designs or how existing designs can be adapted to provide greater levels of protection of people, but it's a it's a short term issue, and to assume that we won't have another pandemic again in the next twenty years, we, we don't know. Um, but we can't allow the same similar type of um, economic crash to happen again. Yeah, yeah. So Abdullah Habash has asked a question, and I'll direct this probably to you, Tony, because I'll I'll add to it, which is. How do we see the future of some of our high social interactive structures um, like stadia and public transport? And the question I was initially going to direct towards you, Tony, which kind of covers some of it, was um, how effective are our buildings uh, and what needs to change in our building design uh, to respond to potential pandemics like this? Um, you know, and that could be with healthcare, it could be education. Uh, Tom's touched a little bit on retail already. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Tony? Well, um, I think one of the really interesting things um, for me that's that's happened uh, is that things that we've been encouraging, uh, but uh, having pressure against them in terms of transformation about how we think about um, operating either a healthcare service or education, but we've been told it's too difficult uh, and will take years to implement. <clears throat> Literally, we're implemented over a weekend. And as an example of that, um, the biggest um, volume of, um, of transactions or interactions in a, in a healthcare facility are outpatient-based. So huge quantities of patients walking into a healthcare environment, a, a hospital, if you like, um, for a face-to-face -face consultation um, with a clinician. Um, uh, uh, it could be a first consultation or a follow-up. Um, and then there is discussion, uh, often di diagnosis after that, maybe some diagnostic tests and, and follow-up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and literally, um, um, all UK hospitals have diverted 70% of that activity into alternative settings and mainly virtual um, and we'd all been told um, although we're encouraging this over several years now we've been told it's just too difficult to do and so I think we're in a new environment um, where uh, there is a we can we can embrace change at a rapid level um, and certainly with all of the um, healthcare clients that we have um, although they're very concerned for their staff at this point, and that continues, um, they are recognising that embracing this rapid change has huge benefits of, of reducing the amount of physical space that we need and breaking these, these old 
models of care um, that really have their um, that, that really have their uh, interests um, in suiting the clinical team to something that is really more person and patient focused. And the similar um, uh, things happening in education uh, to Richard, where um, <coughs> schools will reopen and, you know, the damage that has been done by social isolation um, as a result of social distancing will mean that there are more face-to-face -face and physical interactions um, in the future. But embracing more of a mixed mode so that we can move forward um, uh, and have more space as individuals, but embrace um, both um, physical contact um, and uh, enable um, distanced communication, um, I think is, is, um, is part of our future uh, as consultants and the way that we treat our, our workforce. And the feedback from our clients is that it's, um, it's obvious to them that that's going to be a large part of their futures too. So in terms of how buildings, um, uh, buildings need to respond, um, what, what's really been driven home um, uh, is, um, although we've espoused principles of flexible, flexibility, adaptability and expansion for years, um, these are now becoming uh, the really big words um, uh, in uh, in design. You know, our healthcare system was inflexible to be able to expand quickly. Um, expansion strategies that were played lip surface to in building design um, have have literally become the most mission critical part of uh, of surge hospital provision. Um, and the inflexibility of um, uh, of over customized designs not to um, switch use from um, a an outpatient setting into a emergency setting um, has sort of raised a, a lot of alarm bells in some of those healthcare clients. Right. Well, I think uh, we had a question in from Case Tapuni. Hi, Case. I know for a long time. And it was probably, I think you've answered most of it, Tony, but he was just saying, do we, you know, what effect do we think the current situation will have on long-term planning for public organisations? So I guess design is part of it. But are you, Tony, are you seeing um, within the NHS, for example, are you seeing uh, big changes or lots of noise around how they're going to be considering their organisational strategies for the future? Well, absolutely. And, you know, at a time where the UK is planning 40 new hospitals and business cases are advancing on those, some of them already signed off at either uh, at early stages, every single one of those projects now has to consider uh, how we're designing in a post-COVID world. And the pressures are um, the, the pressures to change are are quite different. It, it's we should be shrinking the size of of, of physical assets uh, and embracing integrated care at an accelerated rate, um, so that um, you know care is given in appropriate settings, and appropriate settings might be purely digital and might be technologically enabled. Um, like dermatology tests from your um, from your smartphone camera, for instance. So um, this um, this point of, of doing things differently, there, I think there is a danger with our with our rapid need to uh, have forty new um, um, acute healthcare facilities in the UK that we bake in old ideas of what healthcare was, rather than pausing at this time and just saying, well, how do these business cases now need to change? Because we know that we don't need to um, uh, bake those old models of care uh, and operational um, methodologies uh, into new ways of working um, because the case has already been proved. Right. Interesting. So just to take in a slightly different um, direction and it's relating to uh, transportation and I kind of, uh, Alan, Tony, I guess, you know, when it comes to, or anybody who wants to ship in from the panel, 
I was thinking, you know, with regard to commuter, commuter transportation and working from home and you know, the use of technology, as we've already talked about, what do we think the future of um, mass transportation might look like? And, you know, the potential climate benefits. And there's been a couple of questions that have come in on this as well um, around uh, the social distancing when we're talking about mass transportation systems um, and, you know, how, how we can manage um, the, the screening and scanning of people using uh, mass transportation systems because, you know, frankly, it's impossible, I believe, to have any kind of mass transportation system that can respect social distancing. Before the COVID virus kicked in, I think there was huge stress on many transport systems anyway. Uh, certainly in, in London, that is the case. And to, to, to overcome that, there may well have been at some stage a, 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 a use which would dictate that half the people would use it one week and half it uses another week and then you're, you're working from home for the other um, part of it and that's a it, it's a really interesting uh, prospect so you can you can obviously reduce the density of people on the the uh, the, the trains and the tubes as a result and um, but also you're giving people then the opportunity to have a better life work life balance which i think again is something that people are 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 looking at so i think this is a massive opportunity for people to get a, a far better way of working, as well as reducing exposure on transportation systems, et cetera. It was interesting, wasn't it? When, when the lockdown happened in, in London and um, there was huge um, issues in the press um, uh, because the uh, uh, London transport had reduced the frequency of the tube trains. And although... Um, although the number of people traveling had reduced by 50 percent if you have 50 percent less trains the tubes were equally as packed and um i was still traveling on those days and thought there was just something fundamentally uh fundamentally wrong i mean it is a real big concern for us about how we re-engage um our um uh, our UK teams, which are very public transport dependent, back into this uh, back into this new world, and um, um, I think um, we are considering everything from um, from much more flexible um, working hours, uh, a complete mixed mode of of people uh, in the office and and away from the office, um, and um, slightly counter to the UK culture. Um, actually entering into the debate on whether we should be wearing some um, um, some face protection going in there so that we're not we're not contributing to um, spreading of the virus but um, I think it's going to be really challenging uh, to um, get back into a situation where we have um, the morning uh, rush hour commutes between eight and nine thirty in particular of people of the several million people that travel into central london it's an interesting uh, paul sparing's asked a question again you know to do with this whole commuting it's an interesting perspective which relates i guess to people's behaviors and, and how nervous people feel but it's about um it increases in car usage during uh, the pandemic people that have been probably afraid to use public transport or public transport systems that are simply just not working. And certainly in this part of the world, um, there's, there have been restrictions on the maximum number of people allowed to travel in vehicles. Um, I just, you know, to the panel generally, I mean, have people generally seen significant rises in the use of uh, personal transportation or have, we gen have you generally seen that people have managed that? Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, from my perspective, I don't live in London. I live uh, outside. So the roads are significantly quieter than before because everybody's locked down. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see when people return to work. Like I, I used to live in London, and because traffic was so bad, I used a motorcycle because it was the only way to get through the traffic. I couldn't understand how people just sat in their cars for hours to just drive a few miles. And it was only something like 10% of the commuting population used cars at that point in time. Um, but still, the roads were 
absolutely jammed. So I, I, I don't see it as being a realistic, realistic alternative in places like London to have more people using cars. I think what you'll see is a massive increase in the use of, of cycling. So I've had a couple of questions in, which I'll just take a, a stop. A couple of them are sort of related. One, um, Priyanka Shah has asked uh, that during this pandemic, isn't it advisable just to stop all new um, architectural works or design construction as, as you see it and wait for a few months to see how things are going? Um, and uh, an anonymous question has said something quite similar. You know, we already have buildings, you know, so there's already offices, people already have homes, uh, we can already function. Do we really need uh, any new buildings? Um, I, I don't know, Tom, I'll throw that one out to you. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because obviously people's safety comes first, but then the industry as a whole is almost paralysed anyway. And I think closing down all construction sites as well would literally just be a nail in a coffin in the short term specifically. Uh, I think... We need to obviously control and make these sites as safe as we possibly can do. But I think particularly from a design perspective, if people are working remotely, there's no reason why we can't continue the design. So when things do get better, we have still got some momentum and there's designs coming through the system for construction in the coming years as well. I think just putting everything on hold, not taking cognizance of the lessons we've learned and how the, the whole dynamic is changing would be a dangerous thing to do. I, I think yeah. also if the, if the question is... is focused on do we need these buildings if that's the reason for kind of stopping some of these projects well before this there's been a tremendous shortage of housing so the suggestion that's been made over here is that if offices weren't needed to the same level as previously they certainly could be converted to residential and would help satisfy that demand yeah i think alan i think to me almost the residential aspect and the domestic buildings is almost a white elephant in the room because everyone's focusing on how we're going to change the major office aspects, the hospitals, retail, etc. But ultimately, all these, these millions of people that are now working from home and we're going to be then living and spending more time in the day in buildings which were previously unconditioned, particularly here in the Middle East where they weren't cooled and in the winter in the UK where they weren't heated. And we have a very old an inefficient housing stock. So I think a lot of attention needs to be put into making sure that we're improving the domestic scale buildings as well and energy efficiency. Because otherwise all these savings in transport and the carbon footprint associated with that is going to be completely consumed by everyone having the heating on or the cooling on all day at home while they work from home, as well as the people in their offices. And I think there are always going to be more old buildings in the world than new. And, you know, if 2019 was the year that the wellness agenda really started to get some traction, I, I think the last, um, the last three months is, is really going to supercharge that, that effort so that we get a much more broad view about what contributes to um, um, wellness, uh, both in the way that we um, that we live, that we travel, that we work, and that we inter inter interact with our public realm. Um, so um, things that were touched on earlier, like um, well and fit well and, and these other broad um, uh, broad measures of, um, of how you build in healthiness into the, into the built environment, I think are going to become hand in glove with other measures um, uh, as was part of the question about do we really need it? Can it be smaller? Um, are we are we taking cognizance of the fact that part of the interactions in the future are going to be digital? See so that, Tommy. That kind of leads into the next question I was going to ask, and um, I'll capture. There's a bit, been a few more questions coming in from the audience, which I'll come back to, but um, it kind of leads into uh, something I am quite interested in, which is smart cities design. And, you know, the lessons that we've learned or that we've had to learn over the last um, few months, how, how do we see that uh, affecting smart cities designs, either adapting current cities or what sort of things should we be incorporating into the design of, of new cities in developing countries? Um, 
what do you think, Tony, and I guess Tom and, and anybody else who wants to chip in on that one, because it's quite a broad subject. I think um, maybe just to kick that off, I think the issues relating to smart cities are still, or the new issues are, st are still the same as the old issues. We live in a, a hugely data-rich environment all around the world, um, but actually harnessing that data and making it um, um, available and visible uh, so that you can um, make decisions about how to live your life. We're still not there yet in the access accessibility um, of that data. So um, as an example, with the work that we do with um, Transport for London, um, we are able to get um, uh, data for the axle weight of every single tube train in London. So we can actually calculate which carriages are busier um, or um, what times of day um, the tubes are busier and when they're not. Um, so that you can control everything from which side, which end of the platform that you should really go to to get on a get on a smaller train uh, or a on a less busier train carriage. And that's just one example about how having a better understanding of how the one element of public life in the city is working could help you make smarter choices about how you live uh, how you live your life. But I think it's the middleware. Um, the data visualization and, and pushing that out to be available for people to make smarter choices, which was a route um, that some places have investigated and been going now. But there's just so much more to do to make our um, our, our cities smarter and and to kind of make that available to empower people's decision making. Yeah, I mean, I think that what's going to happen is. Um, you know, this has really forced us to think every aspect of our lives. Um, and, you know, and Gensler actually speak about connected cities and cities becoming more human rather than less. Um, and we've learned so much through technology and AI and, you know, all, everything that we've experienced through this crisis um, has actually forced us to think about how we can actually become uh, really connected globally um, and look at essentially how we can integrate that into every single project um, th that we're now focusing on. Um, you know, we'd spoken a little bit about um, mobility uh, earlier, and, you know, we were driving really hard to uh, give the streets back to people. Um, and through this crisis, you know, we, we saw the drop, particularly in our region, of how the streets suddenly became quiet. And, um, and that really gave us an opportunity to imagine, you know, what would a city be like if we could focus on that and actually do the micro mobility um, and focus on um, connecting cities in, in very simple ways, almost going back to the simple forms of um, transport and, and communication. Okay. There's another couple of questions come in that I guess relate to this, and, and maybe I was going to maybe dig a little bit deeper into this. Well, I don't know whether you'd call it smart cities or smart sustainable cities. I guess they're related. Um, one person has asked, uh, do we believe that uh, the pandemic has created an opportunity to change not just design principles, but our economic models? You know, what's the economic impact? How should, what should it look like? And I know, okay, that might be going a little bit outside of our areas of expertise, but I'm sure we all have an opinion. Um, so like office space, more of the, relates to the same question is office space footprint increasing or decreasing, you know, so increasing because of social distancing or decreasing because we're all working from home and we don't need as much. Um, you know, aviation industry may change plane seating or seating on trains, things like that. Uh, the sorts of things I was thinking about related to smart, sustainable cities was around the functionality of our buildings. So um, it's been very, because of the social distancing, we've been doing remote working, as we've already spoken a lot about, but schools have been operating remotely, you know, so you've got community buildings like that. You know, can we, can we make buildings more flexible to be used for multiple functions? Um, so rather than having, a, 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 you know, schools as an example, you know, they've been sitting pretty empty for the last few months. 
education's continued, um, is there a way of actually using facilities for something better? And I guess I was thinking things, Tom, around retail is that if a, if a solution, and I'm not saying it is a solution, but if, if a solution is more, say, online shopping, even at a, at a supermarket grocery level, do stores become distribution centers rather than actual retail environments? Um, I mean, what, what, and so my, my, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about flexibility of buildings or frankly, the inflexibility of buildings to be converted to different functions. Yeah, and I think um, that change in retail landscape has been happening over the last 10 years, but this has obviously accelerated it and will continue to accelerate it. So looking at how we can change our buildings and the flexibility of them to be mixed use is going to be a big thing going forward. Obviously, in the retail landscape over the last 10 years, the big boxes have almost become extinct because the department stores, et cetera, are suffering. How we now use those and maximize the uses of mixed spaces, learning centers, exercise centers, remote working, et cetera, I think that's going to be accelerated going forward. And I think, as Majid Alpha team, we have the benefit of being owner operators of malls, communities, hotels, and offices. And I think the big push we'll be doing now in the post COVID world is maximizing the synergies of those. So when we're developing, making sure this little ecosystem is as compact as possible and as flexible as possible. So those, these spaces will start merging within each other rather than being independent as they are now. Interesting. Yeah, I think for offices, I mean, we're seeing, you know, two different aspects. There's the immediate return, uh, you know, what happens. And I think that will be very reactionary. Um, and then going forward, I think offices are, you know, similar to what Tom has spoken about. Um, I don't see office spaces per se reducing, but I do see us taking a completely different view when we're looking at offices. I think that we're going to potentially be looking at creating in a similar way to retail, very flexible, um, agile kinds of environments that can be reconfigured very easily. Um, and, you know, they will be uh, addressing how we can repurpose and how we can um, make use of, of buildings that perhaps have been been dormant. Um, uh, and I, I see that happening across the board for all different sectors. Um, I think there are going to be some really interesting innovations that come out of this. So I think from a design point of view, you know, we're really excited because I think we can innovate and we can drive change. Um, so in a strange way, I'm quite looking forward to seeing what comes next. And yeah. schools were mentioned there, like we're doing quite a lot in terms of looking at um, zero carbon schools in the UK. And like part of the thought process is about um, designing schools for flexibility to be able to adapt. So different uh, curriculums will need to be accommodated in the future. Uh, different schools have different needs. So how would you convert an office space to a storage space? How would you convert a standard classroom to um, science, etc.? And being able to do this type of thing easily has a tremendous benefit in terms of reducing embodied energy and, and cost. So I think all this kind of process is actually complementary. Um, so adapting for future needs will help us adapt as a society in in the, in the face of things like pandemics, but equally just change is natural. We, 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 will, ha we will have to face change going forward. Yeah. I'm going to ask, another, there's a question come through from Stuart MacArthur, and I guess, Tony, this is probably more directed at you, but it's a broader question as well. Um, and what he said is in the post-COVID landscape, the construction delivery capacity in the UK is likely to be impacted. Um, Designer experience and large-scale acute health development is not at is not at the level it was during the PFI heyday. How should procurement of designers and contractors change to get the benefit of collaboration um, and rapid processes that we've seen with the Nightingale hospitals in the UK, for example? And I guess was that's been specifically uh, focused around healthcare. It's probably a very valid question across all sectors. You're on mute, Tony. Um, it is a really interesting question and one that we've been debating internally too. Um, um, the 
the UK government's um, enthusiasm to renew the healthcare estate is meaning that they're releasing 40 last large projects almost at the same time. And, um, and they're doing that through existing procurement vehicles, um, um, which have the least friction in them, getting them out to the marketplace um, quickly. And I don't think those procurement vehicles are necessarily the right vehicles. Um, and um, so further down, so, so that's kind of creating a, uh, an issue for capacity in the marketplace for, uh, for the consultant designers to respond. Um, and I don't think um, um, there's been much uh, innovation uh, applied about how those things are being put out and, and, and maybe there, um, there should be. Um, um, it is also um, creating a situation where um, if these projects um, all go forward to their anticipated timeline, um, it's going to flood the market um, with construction projects where there literally just will not be the capacity to respond to it positively. So um, 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 we can foresee a situation where constructors will be very selective about what they um, what they do um, go for, um, uh, and um, um, we can see um, um, prices um, rising with um, um, with just a greater choice. So, you know, um, uh, I think what should be happening um, is that we do need a new model to go out to the marketplace, um, and we do need a more uh, staged delivery of this pipeline of projects so that people can can um, reorganize and do things differently um although um so not much positive news in in that in that response richard but um what we are seeing as um, um as designers at least is um people coming together in different combinations and skill sets to uh, to face these challenges differently so we are we are putting together multidisciplinary teams with um uh even multiple architects bringing different facets of, of what's going to deliver value and different endpoint outcomes in response to um, the challenges that, that we know that these healthcare um, systems are, are going to have within them. And that's not um, being done as a response to the um, procurement briefs, which are coming out in a, in a very vanilla format, um, but it's just being done because I think the consultant community uh, is um, is aware that uh, things are changing and changing rapidly, and our response should be different and equally as rapid. So I'm not sure I've answered um, uh, Stuart's um, Stuart's question, but I do agree with him that um, we're, we've got um, problems on the uh, on the horizon with this. Yeah. Well, I think touching on Diane's point, I think it is quite exciting times because we're having to do things differently and collaborate a lot more, which hopefully will only lead to more positivity. Um, I think, and, and I just uh, want for you again another question, which was somebody's asked, uh, what will be the major the major measures taken in hospitality post uh, COVID and hospitality design? Yeah, I mean hospitality is. Uh you know, really interesting at the moment because they've been so hard hit. Um, and, you know, like workplace people, there's a perception of, um, you know, is it safe to go back? Uh, you know, is it safe to go and stay in a hotel? You know, what will the cleanliness be? Um, and, you know, we've been approached on a number of renovations, which I think is really interesting um, now because obviously hotels are, are empty and provided the capex um allows people are really looking and using this opportunity to refurbish their spaces because they want to obviously protect their brand and you know they want to ensure that you know they're using this downtime it's a very unusual time for um, hotels um, and a lot of the operators that we're speaking to and managers they all focusing on um, the cleaning protocols in in very similar ways to the way that we're approaching um, workplace um, looking at specific materials um, to ensure that the guests know and communicate, um, that they're continually communicating to guests to let them know what they're actually doing to ensure their safety. 
So a lot of it is around, um, you know, using using this opportunity to put uh, steps in place to be able to ensure that guests really know that any of the surfaces that guests might be touching have actually been addressed um, and looked at. Um, it's really given a lot of rise to uh, looking at technology, uh, you know, things like uh, temperature testing on entry, um, looking again at, um, you know, just using uh, sensors and technology, uh, touchless surfaces, uh, you know, any of those aspects. Um, there's a lot of innovation being looked at around, you know, the key cards and, you know, everything that, that people will actually handle and touch, eliminating those. And that's where, I, you know, I think it is really exciting because um, technology is going to, you know, drive um, a lot of um, a lot of that aspect, and then introducing, you know, things that um, are a little bit unexpected in hotels. You know, I see that there's potentially going to be um, a large drive to look at wellness retreats, for example, um, where you can actually do social distancing uh, within nature. Um, and, you know, those kinds of innovations of just going back to very simple, simple materials, uh, looking at, you know, uh, use of materials in, in hospitality. Um, and again, you know, to the point that um, Tony made about uh, people coming together to work together, I see that happening a lot. Uh, different disciplines joining forces and actually advising one another uh, you know, so healthcare and, and hospitality interfaces, healthcare, workplace, um, experts coming together, um, technology uh, working seamlessly from the outset of how we can integrate that. So, you know, again, I, I see it as a very exciting um, time because it really does start focusing on the human, putting the human at, at the center of design, which is what we all want to do, right? Yeah, yeah. We're kind of coming towards the end of the session. I think I've dealt with most questions as we've gone, but I might pick up on a couple. I was just going to sort of, um, how can I say this nicely, just kind of throw a little grenade in at the end, um, just to be a bit uh, provocative. But I'm going to combine two sorts of questions and just get a brief thought from everybody. Um, just in some of the reading I've done, and I'm not picking on the UK for any other reason than the information is far more readily available. Um, but, you know, just as a simple statistic, I think um, I'd estimated that the UK could spend over £20 billion pounds in its staff retention or furloughing scheme um, over the three months that it was intended to operate. Um, yet the I think the annual budget investment from the UK on the climate and nature um, for the year was something like 17 billion. And it started, for me, I started to question where the money's being spent and are we spending enough money in the right places? And uh, the question it, it um, raised for me was, do people think the climate crisis is as important as um, the health crisis, the coronavirus or, or the next pandemic? Um, you know, my, my simple um, assessment of it in, in a healthcare context is um, COVID-19 is the trauma patient and the climate crisis is the cancer patient. You know, one's long term and one happens very, very quickly. So I'd be quite interested just to get each of your um, views a, a minute or so each on what you think. So I suppose, Tom, if you want to start, you're at the top of my screen. Okay, uh, I think it comes, it ties back again to what we discussed before about what do we pause industry, do we stop? And I think in these times, and Diane touched on it about hotels, which is good. I think a lot of companies and government levels where there's a restriction on CapEx in the next couple of years, I think we need to make sure that we don't lose focus on the climate agenda, particularly in a lot of these short-term investments to actually generate or save uh, energy or make our systems more renewable uh, have a long-term offset so if we do miss these next few years where we're starved of capex and we don't implement these energy saving measures it's going to come back to hit us in 10-15 years time so i think we need to maintain focus and look at the wider life cycle analysis picture 
What do you think, yeah. I would say more so than ever, uh, we really need to focus on uh, our energies 100% on designing the way that we were. I think right now, uh, rather than have this knee-jerk reaction and place one element over another in terms of importance, I think would be so detrimental. Um, I think more so than ever, uh, good use of energy, good quality design uh, really needs to be focused on our planet. This is the only one we have. Uh, and I think our energies um, in terms of, you know, focusing on all of the aspects that are addressed in both lead and in well should really become for architects and designers, absolutely, and governments actually, you know, for governments to actually make it a non-negotiable. Um, I really believe that that's going to drive uh, extraordinary positive change going forward. Okay, Alan, what do you think? Um, I don't think there's necessarily a um, conflict in the sense that um, zero carbon buildings is about designing buildings differently. And it's most of it's about reducing wastage and getting the design right in the first place. And the other part of it is making sure that what's designed is actually built and it's working properly. You can get reductions in energy of 30, 40% in a building just simply by making sure everything's working properly. So um, I, I think it's very hard for on, on a government level for, to... Um, to respond in the same way. So the COVID, we've seen a pile of money being thrown at it because people dying today are going to be what you focus on. It's very hard to worry about people dying in 40, 50 years time. Uh, having said that, I, I have seen significant shifts in the way people are thinking about this. And it's become an absolute priority for all businesses, uh, for all organizations. And even investors now have got on board and they're saying that they won't invest in companies that aren't uh, treating this seriously. So it, it's a question whether it, it goes as deep as this right around the world. If it, if it does, then I think it'll just roll on. Tommy, what do you think? Um, well, you know, when we've seen the, the US unemployment figures absolutely skyrocket over the last month, um, I think our government's um, furlough scheme in the UK um, it's hugely beneficial to industries that have been decimated. Um, but like Alan, I don't really see um, a, a conflict. I, I think the, the, the trends that were starting, uh, the real interest in wellness, um, um, zero carbon, um, I think our current situation can only accelerate the application of that in um, uh, and the direction of travel of it. And I think we will get more innovative ways of trying to uh, to, to do that. And, and one of the most sustainable forms of development is looking at reducing the amount of development that we have. So I think embracing um, things like um, digital strategies through um, through many industries to actually reduce the overall footprint that we have, physical footprint. Um, it's all going to play its part and um, um, I think there should be an exciting future uh, an exciting and more sustainable future for us all um, I think we're pretty much at the end I suppose just picking up on what you said Tony I should just clarify I wasn't being critical of the furloughing <laughs> scheme in the UK I was really just drawing the parallel in the amount of spending you know that uh, where the money can be found and whether we need to be thinking about other things as urgently. Uh, look, I think we're probably at the end. Um, I'd certainly like to thank all of you for um, joining this debate and I hope you found it uh, interesting and any of the audience that may have questions or may want to suggest topics for further uh, events, please send them through, keep sending them through and I'll just... Uh, and over to Olga to say a few words. Yes, thank you very much. That was a very interesting discussion. Thank you to all of you, to our speakers, for your time and uh, sharing 
uh, all these interesting thoughts and views. Um, I think we had a very engaged audience. So thank you to our audience. A lot of questions came through and I think we had a lot of positive comments already that they also enjoyed. So thank you very much for staying with us uh, for this one hour. And um, as I mentioned at the start of this webinar, we will be sharing the link with all of you and it will be posted on our Kandal um, YouTube channel. So if you would like to revisit or share with anyone else, please do so. Um, and uh, well, we, we hope you stay safe and in good health. And uh, till next time, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for organizing the great you. conversations. Yeah, it was definitely. Great. Have a good okay. day. Bye -bye. Have a good day.